Don't blow it. Look at somebody else and say, friend of mine, you have another chance. Don't blow it. I want to talk to you this morning about seize your second chance. Seize your second chance. In the three scriptures that I read for you today, all three of them have something in common. The first one from Luke 15 and 18 talks about a young man who took all that was promised him in his inheritance. The Bible says he went to a far country and lived a party life. And after losing all his money, had to sell the ring that was on his finger. Got rid of his fine clothes and the garments that he was wearing. Found himself in a hall pen. About to wonder if he could eat the same slop that the hogs were eating. And all of a sudden, he came to himself, I believe. I'm going to go back home and tell my father, yeah, I messed up, daddy. You don't even have to call me a son. Just make me one of your hired servants. But his father gave him a second chance. In the next text, this is a woman caught in the act. Brothers had set her up. Wanted to not only shame and embarrass her, but it was about testing Jesus to see whether he would obey the laws of Moses or whether they could trick him into being against what he stood for. And this woman caught in a very act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus. You remember the story. She's there quivering barely a rag of garment over her and the brother saying Moses says stone her what say you Jesus mm. the Bible said Jesus wouldn't answer them immediately but he wrote in the sand they asked him again and when he looked up he said you who are without sin you throw the first stone and they got to thinking about it the Bible said one by one they all left and finally there was no one there but the lady of Jesus and the master said, where are those that condemn thee? And when the woman opened her eyes, she said, Lord, no man. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. She had a second chance. I think I talked to you a few days ago about Genesis 50 and 20. At this point, Israel, the father of Joseph and his brothers, has died. And now his brothers are nervous that perhaps Joseph let us live as long as daddy was alive. But now that daddy's gone, he gonna fix us, oh, so help me, he's gonna fix us. And why would he need to fix them? You remember, they got jealous of his dream, jealous of his vision, jealous of what God had showed him. And because of their jealousy, they thought they would kill him. But instead, they threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery in Egypt, where in Egypt he got falsely accused of attempting to rape his master's wife, labeled as a sexual predator, thrown in prison, forgotten there by the butler and the cook who he watched over. And finally, one day God remembered him, and he winds up being the prime minister of Egypt because of the guilt and the favor that lied within him. And now his brothers come down to Egypt looking for something to eat and of course treats them well, fools with him a little while, jerks him around a little while, but eventually tell them, I'm Joseph, your brother. And they thought, oh my God, we are dead. He said, no, I'm not going to harm you. Bring my little brother, bring my father here so that I may show them kindness. And the whole family moves to Egypt. But now it's 17 years later and dad is dead and they're thinking, we're in for it now. He's going to get us shown up now. So they concoct this strange letter. Dear Joseph, Daddy said when he dies, don't do us any harm. Remember how he loved us and we be your brothers. So Daddy said, leave us alone. Joseph knew that that wasn't from his father. Because his father would have told him whatever he had to say face to face. But he realized his brothers were nervous because they thought perhaps way down inside he had not forgiven them and that their lives were in danger. He said, listen, I am not going to harm you. 
I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your children. All of y'all, you are safe. I'm not going to hurt you. You have a second chance. The other day, I was watching, uh, I think it's called Up in the Air. George Clooney was starring in this movie as a person who had to go around firing people for companies that wanted to downsize. And so people that had been there 30 years, 28 years, and a long time, all of a sudden, they walk into this room with no warning. And there is this man saying, sir, I'm afraid because of the economic situation of America and what's happening in our country, we're going to have to let you go. Or we're offering you a package. Or we are telling you that in 30 days or whatever, you will no longer have a job. Kind of like what's happening with us with Slama J, Baker Hughes, Patterson Oil, and a number of other oil companies in our area. As the price of oil drops, many folks are losing their jobs. And as a result of them losing their jobs, the surrounding folk, people in the banking industry, financial institutions, restaurants, and the list goes on and on. Everyone in our area affected by the oil and gas industry, they are downsizing and a lot of folk are losing their jobs. It may be somebody you know, it may be you personally, or it may be that your company has already warned you, things are tight, we don't know what we're going to do, uh, so be prepared for the worst. Well, as George Clooney was talking to one middle-aged manager, and the man was giving him some choice words about how dare you just walk in here on a Friday and interrupt my life, tell me my future is over, what am I to do with my family, what am I to do about my children, on and on and on and on. Clooney noticed that in his resume, he had been trained to be a French chef. And so Clooney asked the man the question, back when you started, how much did it take to buy you away from your dream? And at that pivotal moment, the middle-aged manager thought back to the time he decided to settle for a steady paycheck in exchange for what he really wanted to do with his life. Is the life that you are living now one that you settle for because of hard times in your youth or are you living your dream? Is the life that you're living now is one that happened because you got pregnant. You got somebody pregnant. You got in trouble with the law. You lost a parent, a father, mother, or some other catastrophic event happened in your life and knocked you off of the track that you had in mind as a young person. See, for you and I who belong to God, the day we were born, God had a track for us to run on and an assignment for us to feel. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Yes. So which life are you living now? Are you living the one where you hate to get up in the morning and go to work? Are you living the one where when you get through working, you've got to have a drink or a hit on something to calm your nerves? Are you working on the job that is causing you high blood pressure, heart trouble, and a number of other illnesses, all because you are not doing what you desire to do? Let me ask you to roll back the hands of time just a little bit. Flip back in your mind to when you were a young person growing up, when you were a youngster, and the whole world was before you. What did you have in mind to do? My brother Jerry and I were raised on a farm, and so we were going to grow up, go to college, join the military, see the world, and we were going to retire in Colorado and raise cattle and be old rich men looking out at our cows, telling the Lord, thank you. 
Well, first couple of points went through. We did go to college. He joined the Army. I joined the Air Force, but I was bad, so they put me out. <laughs> he stayed in for almost 20-some years and retired, moved to Colorado. You see where I am this morning. The only difference is we never got the cattle. But what plan did you have? So, so Dr. Boyer, when I went to the university, I, I was so enamored of my band director, Mr. Leon Anderson, that as my mentor, I was going to college to be a band director. I was gonna direct the band. So when the football team came out and they got ready to go, and they said, ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem, it was gonna be me with the baton in my hand. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. But when I got to college, I discovered I was unprepared to be a music major. Yes, I, it was a grace of God that I won a music scholarship. That's how I got to college. But I discovered I was very good on the tuba. But I didn't know theory. I had not had any of those other classes to prepare me to read music and to be a conductor or a composer or what. So I said, oh no, this is not going to work. So I took one of those tests that showed I was pretty smart. It said I was good at botany and biology and zoology and chemistry. So I became a health-oriented profession major and I thought I would be a doctor. And I did very well with my biology courses and my chemistry courses. And I love organic chemistry, analytical chemistry, and all of those things. But I fooled around and had some friends who got in trouble. They're in Intermediate, Mississippi. We should have known that there are certain people, if you look like us, that you just don't mess with. And one of my friends, because he was 6'8", 300 pounds, he could knock anybody down on the football team, senior in the university, ready to be drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, got caught in the wrong place with the wrong kind of person, and they gave him 30 years. My heart changed, my mind changed. I started listening to Ake Rock Brown. I started listening to Huey. I started listening to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I said, let's bomb Mississippi. I became a radical. Everything was black power. Because I was hurt, I was angry, I was mad, and I thought Dr. King's life had been in vain. We're going to have to kill some folk in order to make a change. And then I heard God speak to me and say, you have lost your mind. This is not the plan I have for you. And he told me to get out of Mississippi before I got killed or before I killed somebody. You are not a murderer and blood shall not be on your hands. And I was like, I can't do that, God. I got a music scholarship. I got a health profession scholarship. I don't go pay to go to school. School pays me to go here. I got it made in the shape. He said, leave. Then our older brother, Sister Benoit, and our older brother died quickly, suddenly in Chicago at a young age just getting his life together, just ready to fulfill his dream, just got a wife and a bunch of new children, and the Lord called him home. And he spoke to me and he said, see, you don't have to be an old man for me to call you. I call the young as well as the old. And that critical point in my life changed my entire future. And I left Mississippi and came down to Lafayette, and the Lord said, you have a second chance. Yes. You and I, brothers and sisters, will have situations that occur in our lives that will cause us to have a second chance. Is the difficult situation that you're in right now a God-given opportunity for you to go back and fulfill the dream that God gave you in the first place? Is the wall that you are bumping your head against, the door that will not open, the blessing that will not come, the dream that will not be fulfilled, is it perhaps God trying to tell you, now is the time for you to go back and try again at 
the thing that you truly and really desire to do. When I went to seminary in New Orleans, Brother Clayton, I lived with a young man named Dr. Windsor Dennis. Dr. Dennis started out as a band director, showed me his pictures of when he was directing his high school band, and oh, they had the baddest band in New Orleans. But at the age of 41, he decided I really wanted to be a doctor. Quit teaching school, gave up being a band director, packed his lovely wife, murdered up, and they moved to Michigan. And he went to Michigan State and became a physician. After becoming a doctor, he went on to become an orthopedic surgeon. So by the time I met him, he is now practicing medicine for about three or four years, doing super well because he was not afraid to stop where he was and make his dream come true. Have you sold your dream? And if so, how much did you sell it for? Have you abandoned what you really want to do in life? And if so, for how much? All of us have gone through unexpected tragedies, unexpected situations, but at some point, God freezes time. He stops the clock. He puts a roadblock or something in front of you where you may believe, oh my God, life is over, but he's saying, take another road. He's saying to you, try again. There are a whole lot of folks who God may try again. You remember Moses? Moses knew he was born to be a leader, but he wound up being a murderer, a fugitive from justice. And while on the backside of the desert, found the wrong kind of woman, married her, had children by her, and he thought, man, have I fallen a long way from the house of Pharaoh to now I'm married to this girl with these half-breed children down in the backside of a desert, and I'm nothing more than my father-in-law's shepherd boy. And then he saw the burning bush. And he heard the I am that I am say, Moses, take your shoes off. The ground you standing on is holy ground. Here is your assignment. The same as when you were born. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God never changes his mind. You remember Jonah? Jonah wants you to go down to Nineveh, preach to the folks so they can repent and get their lives straight. Jonah's like, I hate them. I don't want anything to do with them. I'm going in another direction. God sent a storm, may have been like Patricia. They threw him overboard and Jonah's drowning in the sea and God has a prepared fish. Everybody help me say, prepare. See, whales don't swallow things as big as humans. Their system is not designed to take a man in whole and nothing happens to him. But this prepared fish swallows Jonah whole, takes him to the bottom of the sea, and for three days, and you know a whale can't stay in the bottom of the ocean that long. Every now and then he's got to come up, surface and... But for three days, he's in this prepared fish in the bottom of the sea. And God has a chance to talk to him. Jonah said, Lord, if you give me another chance, I promise you. And the whale spits him up on dry land. Jonah gets in a hurry to go do what God told him to do. Because he said, I have a second chance. My favorite character in the Bible is Brother David. And y'all remember David went from shepherd boy to king. While David was king, Brother Miller, he said, I got this. I have come from fighting lions and bears and watching over my daddy's sheep to where now I'm the king of both Israel and Judah. I have united the kingdom. Oh, what a mighty God I serve. But when he should have been at war, look over the patio and saw a black girl. And when he saw that girl, her name is Bathsheba, by the way. Everything good in David 
and went away. Or read your Bible. I'm trying to warn you. I don't care how holy you think you are. You better stay with God. Now something can happen to you in a moment. Y'all don't want to believe me. In the twinkling of an eye, you can go from having everything to having nothing. This brother looked at that girl. He said, hey, whoa, my, my, my. Woo, bring her here. So she's somebody else's wife. Bring her here. She belongs to Uriah. Bring her here. When Bathsheba got the news, the king wanted to see you. She said, what? <laughs> the king wants to see you. Help. She said, here I am. Take me to the king. <laughs> and you know the rest of the story. She sends him a terrible note <coughs> a few days later. David, yes, dear, I'm late. Uh-oh. <laughs> Tries to cover it up. Tries to bring her husband home so that no one will ever know. Tell your neighbor, you can't hide from God. A whole lot of us looking good, smelling good, sitting in here, thinking we're all that. Oh, but... God saw you when you didn't think he saw you. Anyway, David commits a numerous amount of crimes and wrongdoings and it takes a prophet to tell him, you didn't get away, God saw you. But God speaks to David's heart and David said, Lord, against thee and thee only have I committed this sin. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me, Lord. Purge me, Lord. Clean me up, Lord. And then he said, create me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. Make me to hear joy and gladness again. Because, Lord, I'm broken down to the bones. And when he gets through praying, he says, that whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And God sends a prophet back and said, David, you shall live. You got a second chance. And then, finally, there's John Mark. John Mark is the author of the book of Mark. He is the nephew of one of the wealthy brothers in the Bible, a man by the name of Barnabas. When Barnabas received the good news of the gospel, being rich, he went and sold a lot of his real estate, a lot of property and other stuff. He owned, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet so that the work of the church could begin. Paul and Barnabas get ready to go on their first missionary journey to plant churches all around Asia Minor and they take Barnabas' nephew John Mark with them. But when they get to the first city and John Mark sees all the trials, the tribulations and the trouble that they are going to be facing, he gets scared. And when they get to the next city and Paul has to look at a young man and say, may you be blind for a season, you foul spirit of the devil. And that man had turned blind, insolent, walking around looking for somebody to lead him. John Mark said, this is too much for me. Packed his bags and ran swiftly back to Jerusalem. Angered Paul to no degree upset him to no degree and he was mad at the preacher because he was a coward he was afraid he wouldn't own up to being what he was supposed to be preachers are we owning up to what God called us to be or are we chicken are we afraid are we giving God all kinds of excuses of why I can't be a good deacon? Why I can't be a good minister? Why I can't be a good missionary evangelist? Why I can't be a good choir member? Why I can't be a good servant of the Lord? Why I can't be at church when I ought to be? Even though you have given me six whole days. John Mark turned around and ran home. When he got ready to go again, Barnabas said, we're going to bring John Mark with him. Paul said, over my dead body. I want nothing to do with him. I want nothing to do with him. He is coward. He is unreliable. You can't trust him. You can't depend on him. He gives you his word and then walks away like he never did it. He don't do what he's supposed to do. And then look at you like, what's wrong with you? What's the problem with you? No, and he has not measured up. No. John Mark cannot come. But Barnabas loves his nephew. 
Loves the young lad and says to Paul, well, okay, I'll take him with me. You take Silas. And you know what happened to Paul and Silas? Yes, yes. Acts says, while in jail, at midnight, they have been beaten, their backs are bloody, their clothes torn, and they are thrown in an inner dungeon, Brother Mike, and at midnight they pray. Thank God for hearing their prayers. But as for Barnabas and John Mark, Barnabas works with John Mark a little while longer. Brother Gerald, he works with John Mark, teaches him, prepares him. Brother Miller, he puts his arm around him while John Mark trying to run. No, 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 we can't run. We got to stand our ground. We got to do what we're supposed to do. He does not allow him, Brother Price, to chicken out. Brother, uh, uh, Brother Zeno, he makes sure that John Mark becomes the man he's supposed to be. And at the end of Paul's life, you'll find it in 2 Timothy, when he's writing his last will and testament, this line struck my attention. Send me John Mark. Anybody hear what Paul is saying now? The same Paul that wanted nothing more to do with him in the book of Acts. Now he said a few years later, send me John Mark. He has proven to be profitable unto me. Oh, look at somebody and say, hello, John Mark. You have a second chance. Somebody give God some praise right there. In each of the characters that I have laid out before you today that received the second chance, when they look back at the most painful chapters in their lives, whether it was when they lost all their money, whether it's when they were so embarrassed because they were caught in the very act of doing wrong, or when it was betrayal by family members, each of them came to the same conclusion. The enemy meant it for harm, but God intended it for good. Now help me preach. Turn around and ask three people, what's your story? Come on, ask three people, what's your story? Come on. See, see, sometimes when you meet the saints, they mean. They're bitter. They got an ugly attitude. Sometimes when you meet the same, how you know? Oh, I don't know. You wish you hadn't asked them. Sometimes when you meet a saint, other than in church, in church everybody put their mask on when they come through the door. But other than in church, when you meet a saint, sometimes they are mean, bitter, sad, and their testimony is not quite what it was on Sunday morning. Yeah, like Joseph, you've been betrayed by family members. Like Joseph, your brothers and sisters or your daughters or your children took your inheritance, took what you worked for all your life, squandered it away, and now they're back asking for more? The devil? <laughs> like Joseph, you've been hurt, you've been disappointed. Maybe baby girl wound up marrying pretty boy Floyd. Or some other character. And you hate him. But that's still your baby girl. What's your story? My cousin dropped a dime on me. And I got 20 years and he got 10 months. Yeah, I'd be mad too. What's your story? My wife betrayed me with my best friend. Oh, man, that's the oldest story in life. Somebody please, won't you play another? Somebody done, somebody wrong, some. So I can feel at home. That's the oldest story in the world. What's your story? Why are you mean? Why are you bitter? Why are you disappointed? Why are you? Oh, Lord. Look at that. On the morning, 
Oh, I used to feel so uninspired. And when I knew I had to face, don't act like I'm the only one who knows that, another day. Ask your neighbor again, what's your story? Some of you haven't smiled in so long until it would almost crack your face. Some of you haven't laughed in so long, you don't even remember what your own voice sounds like when you're laughing. Some of y'all are got so much anger and bitter and stuff you are carrying. Woo! People look at you and go the other way. Yeah, you had your heart broken. But when you meet a new love, she ain't responsible for what your old love did. Right. Let it go. Let it go. I fan club. <laughs> we all have pain. Yes, sir. We all suffer elemental. We've all been scarred and wounded just because I look good on the outside. Oh, if I could show you my heart, my soul, my spirit, you'd go, oh my. See, when God performs a surgery, he doesn't leave scars and wounds. Oh, I'm talking about when God performs a surgery. You cannot tell where the staples or the stitches are, where they glued you back together again. When God performs the surgery, look at somebody and tell them, you have a second chance. Thank you, God. If you could start all over again, what would you do this time? Brother Ricky has gotten into retirement now. Still young, healthy, money coming from everywhere. Blessed of the Lord, strong, vibrant. So what do I do now? Those of you that's lost your job, yes, God took that job away. But like the middle-aged manager who had been trained as a French chef, what is it you really want to do? My mother told me, Sister Vi, when she turned 65, she was going to college. I said, well, praise the Lord. And I wondered who going to hire her at that age by the time she gets through. I'm not going to be hired. I have given the man 50 years of my life. I've been working since I was 10. This I do for myself. And when she finished that, she said, son, I'm going to seminary. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> now mama's going to become a preacher. Praise God. And she went to the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. The same one that Bishop Winbush, Brother Gatlin, and Paul Gatlin graduated from. Now my mama is enrolled as a student. I said, well, wonders never cease. My father retired from his regular job. And uh, he said, son, I got a new testament, a new story in life. I said, what's that, daddy? I'm joining the army again. I said, what? <laughs> and he went back and he joined the uh, reserves. And every Saturday, I'm calling, what you doing? Oh, I got something with my reserve. First Saturday, what you doing? Going to drill. Next Saturday, what you doing? Oh, we got a trip to so-and-so. My father understood. I now have a chance to do all the stuff I ever wanted to do. So now I'm going to do it. Yes, yes. If you're at a crossroad in your life where you're sick and tired of doing what you're doing, yes, God. ask God to open another door, a different door. Ask God to show you how to move from where you are to put you on the track that he designed for you. You will never be fulfilled. You will never be happy. You will never be what you're supposed to be until what you are doing 
is in tune with what the plan and the purpose God had for your life. And it's not too late. If your story has you mean, unfulfilled, grieved, mad at others who are doing what they desire to do, you are living the wrong story. Now you have opportunity to get it right. Everybody stand it. If you could do it all over again, if you had the opportunity to try again, what would you be? What would you do? What would you try to accomplish in life? I can't be a doctor now because I'm too busy. I don't have the opportunity to go back to med school because I'm so busy with other people counting on me that I couldn't do that. But a few years ago, I said to Mother Gatlin, we're going to open up a medical clinic. She said, what? I said, all these little children with tubes in their ears and nose running all the time and they can't get their lessons. I said, something is wrong. And though we were not doctors, we opened up the A1 Kid Med Center where we saw poor children. Children with parents who didn't really concern themselves about their health. We got a chance to make sure they got vaccinated, that they got eye inspections, ear inspections, and many of them we discovered were very ill and we were able to refer them to real doctors. And it cost them nothing. After Katie Parish, we took on Jeff Davis Parish, then we took on Vermillion Parish, and we would run all over to Head Starts and daycare centers and other places, examining children to make sure that they wouldn't go blind, they wouldn't go deaf, and the parents would find out what was wrong with them. Then I get angry. The van is showing up. My boyfriend here, y'all come back tomorrow. The van would show up. My food stamp didn't come in. I'm on the phone with these people. I can't be worried with y'all. And we're talking about their children's health. Is it any wonder that there are so many emotional and mental problems in our community that go undiagnosed because we were not aware that there was hell? What would you do if you could start over and try again? The hands of you that have a dream. Let me see your hand. If you have a dream that yeah, there's that, something I want to do. There's something I still want to accomplish. There are some things that I believe that God can help me. Okay, put, put them down. Now, if you don't have a dream, something wrong. If you don't have a reason for waking up every morning, something is wrong. Yes, sir. If there are no goals, no plans, no dreams, something is wrong. I woke up in the middle of the night Sister Whitney, and I think I'm seeing stuff. I looked in the corner. Is that an airplane? Put my glasses up. Not only was there an airplane, there was a billion dollar bill. And I looked. Big old mansion for a house. And some, I said, what the world? The supervisor, while I was away, I always know when I come back, something gonna be different. <laughs> Had put a vision board in my bedroom. Picture of a big, beautiful church on it. So that when I open my eyes in the morning, the second thing I see 
Got it. Don't get it twisted. Amen. Yeah, Bishop. First thing I see is the best thing in the whole wide world. But the second thing I see is the board that says our dreams. So that before I hit my knees in prayer, I got that vision of where we're going, what we need to do, what we need to accomplish. It's in my soul, it's in my spirit now. So when I'm saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Lord, you see that board over there? In Jesus' name, our church is paid for. In Jesus' name, I got the lyrics yet. Because I'm tired of hell for it. In Jesus' name, I got a helicopter. Because the road is to love. In Jesus' name. Why are y'all looking at me like I'm crazy? Look at somebody and say, get your own dreams. You can't steal nobody else's. It's got to be yours. Only thing I need to add to it is some cows. Hello, somebody. <laughs> somebody said, praise the Lord. Praise the the masters, I was in Shreveport, and I went to the state fair. And I said, ooh, this is good. I haven't been here in 30 some years, but no. And the first place I went, where's Brother Mark? Where was the first place we went? <laughs> to the livestock barn. Hello, somebody. And I took pictures of Beef masters and brainless and Angus cattle. And they were like, man, these are some big cows. That's what I grew up. And I sent them to supervise. I said, look what the Lord is doing. She said, this boy is in his 50s and still loving cows. That's my dream. That's my vision. I asked your neighbor, do you have a dream? Those of you that would dare to believe God for your dream. And hear me, I don't care how broke you are. The little log cabin mother and I live in now, we had a dollar sixty-three cents in the bank when they approved our loan. And I couldn't afford to build a whole house, so I built what I could. And my helper helped me to lay carpet, paint walls, put up ceilings for milk. We lived on one floor, because that's all I could afford. And we got the rest of it fixed as we had money come in. Amen. But God gave us the money to build Amen. with no money, no credit, Amen. no history of anything. The lady said, we're not supposed to make these kind of loans, but I like y'all. You were approved. Amen. Oh, you talking about cutting up once I got out of the bank. <laughs> not in the bank. Hello, somebody. We want them to come with them little white jackets. Hello, somebody. But when I got out of the bank, you talking about cutting up on the street telling God thank you what's your dream brother Blake what is it you desire to do with your life bow your heads in the quietness of this moment you tell God what you want him to do in your life somebody to tell them you can make it. Will you help me to seal this word by getting out of that pew and go find three or four people 
and just encourage them to try again. Tell them they have a second chance. Will you do that for me? Come on, just get out of that seat. You may not even know, but just go encourage them.